lesson or in this week we're going to move on to magnetic fields and Faraday's law and in this lesson specifically we're going to be looking at electromagnetic induction which sounds very scary but actually isn't so we're going to enjoy we're going to join the mindset learn team as they explain what electromagnetic induction is Hello grade 11s, we will investigate electromagnetic induction today. We know that when there is a flow of charge in a wire, a magnetic field forms around the wire. Today, we will investigate to see if the opposite is possible. Will a magnetic field be able to produce a current? Before we go any further, let's talk about some terminology. We first need to know what EMF stands for. EMF stands for the electromotive force. Scientists today think of it as a measure of the total electrical potential energy per unit charge available in a battery or source of electricity. EMF is measured in volts and is sometimes referred to as potential difference. A galvanometer is an instrument used to detect, measure, and determine the direction of small electric currents. It is connected across the ends of a conductor. This is what a zero-centered galvanometer looks like. The needle can either deflect to the left or to the right of zero. The deflection is determined by the size of the induced EMF and also by the direction of the motion of the needle. Another term we need to understand before we do the experiment is the word induced. Try this. Hold your hands shoulder width apart and clap them together very hard. Do you feel the pain in your hands? Well, you just induce pain in your hands. In our experiment, we will induce current. For the induced pain, our action was to clap our hands together. What action is required to induce current? In a simple circuit, there is a source of energy, for example, a cell or battery, to create a potential difference. This produces current that causes a light bulb to glow. Remember that without a potential difference or EMF applied to the ends of a conductor, there will be no current in the conductor. In the experiment that Kiki is about to show us, there is no source of EMF. However, her action induces the current. Here is a coil of insulated copper wire. You can see that there are many loops in this coil and they are wound together very closely. The coil is connected to a center zero galvanometer. I'm going to push the north pole end of a strong magnet into the coil. Observe what happens to the needle of the galvanometer. The needle of the center zero galvanometer moves to the right and then it comes back to zero again. And look, when the magnet is pulled out of the coil, the needle jumps in the other direction and then it comes back to zero again. And if the magnet is pushed in and pulled out and pushed in and pushed out, we can make the needle of the center zero galvanometer vibrate from side to side. What can you deduce from the fact that the needle of the galvanometer moved? The moving needle tells us that an EMF has been detected by the galvanometer across the ends of the coil. So current has moved through the coil. Look carefully again at the apparatus. We have only a magnet and a coil and a galvanometer with some connecting leads. There is no battery here. So what is the source of the EMF? Well, it is the movement of the magnet in the coil that created the EMF. Only when the magnet moved was an EMF detected and electricity generated. Michael Faraday used the term electromagnetic induction for the process of generating electricity by moving a magnet in a coil. The EMF produced by a moving magnet in a coil is called the induced EMF 
and the resulting current is called the induced current. Michael Faraday did a version of this experiment to investigate the electromagnetic induction about 180 years ago. Did you see that in this experiment, Kiki moved the magnet relative to the solenoid? Let's see if it also works when she moves the solenoid relative to the magnet. Faraday found that there is another way of inducing an EMF in a coil. Instead of moving the magnet, move the coil and keep the magnet fixed in position. Watch what happens. The voltage sensor registered an induced EMF when the coil moved over the magnet. This shows exactly what Michael Faraday discovered. We can say that whenever you move a magnetic field relative to a coil, an EMF will be induced in the coil. It does not matter if the coil moves or if the magnet moves. What matters is relative motion between the coil and the magnet. We know now that a current will be induced when a magnet is moved relative to a coil of conductors. What determines the strength of the induced EMF? There are three factors that influence the strength of the induced EMF. They are the speed of the movement, the strength of the magnet, and the number of coils on the solenoid. We will look at the speed of the movement first. KK is making use of a computer program to obtain the data. This will help us to draw a conclusion very easily. First, I'll push the north pole of the bar magnet into the coil slowly and then stop. Look at the readings of EMF I have for this time. The voltage sensor registered a small positive EMF while the magnet was moving, but then returned to zero volts when the magnet stopped moving. Now I'm going to push the north pole of the bar magnet into the coil very quickly. Watch what happens to the EMF readings. Once again, the voltage sensor registered a positive EMF in the coil, but this time the value was much greater. Compare the two graphs that were obtained during the two different motions. When the motion of the magnet relative to the magnet is slow, a small EMF is induced. And when the motion is fast, a large EMF is induced. The second factor affecting the EMF is the strength of the magnet. Do not assume that a bigger magnet is a stronger magnet. A stronger magnet has more magnetic field lines around it than a weaker magnet. Let's test this idea by measuring the EMF induced by a strong and a weak magnet moving into the same coil at the same speed. We will do this by dropping the two magnets through the coil from the same height. Your job is to watch the reading on the voltage sensor to see if there is a difference in the EMF. Can you see that the stronger magnet induced a bigger EMF in the coil? This experiment confirms that a stronger magnet induces a larger EMF. The last factor affecting EMF is the number of coils on the solenoid. Kiki, please show us your findings. Faraday found that another way to increase the induced EMF is to increase the number of loops or turns in the coil. Let's test this experimentally. Here is another coil of the same length as the previous one, but this one has less turns it has 240 turns. 
And when I drop the magnet through this coil, you will be able to see that I get a maximum reading on the voltage sensor that is smaller than the first one. What conclusions can we draw from this experiment? We have confirmed that the number of turns in a coil is related to the size of the EMF induced in the coil. Thank you, Kiki. From today's lesson, we learned that we can induce a current in a conductor if we move a magnet relative to that of turns in the conductor. To make the induced current very strong, we must have a fast motion with a strong magnet in a solenoid with lots of turnings on it. So grade 11s, I hope you found that very useful. So basically what they've done is they've turned it round. Before we were inducing a magnetic field, okay, when we had current flowing through a wire. This, t this time we are making there be a current by moving a magnet through a coil of wire. So I hope that you understood that. Please make sure that you did. Go through the video again if you didn't. And you need to learn the things that increase the size of the electromagnetic induction, which are the size of the magnet, in other words, not how big it is, but how strong it is. Secondly, the speed at which the magnetic field and the electric field cut each other. And thirdly, the number of coils. Please go study that. Make sure you know it and understand it. Have a great day.